Welcome to Five Books for Catholics, where an expert selects and explains five outstanding books in some aspect of Catholic life, doctrine or culture. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, 1756-1791, ranks with Johann Sebastian Bach and Beethoven as one of the greatest Western composers. His father, Leopold, was a musician in the courts of the Prince Archbishop of Salzburg and a musical pedagogue. When Leopold began to give clavier lessons to his seven-year-old daughter, Nanel, her younger brother listened attentively, started playing it himself at the age of four, and was composing his first pieces at the age of five. Between 1762 and 1773, Leopold brought the two child prodigies on tours around the main European cities and courts, from Rome to London, hoping to promote his son's future career. Wolfgang first worked as a court composer for the Prince Archbishop of Salzburg, but, desirous of a better salary and opportunities to compose operas, he resigned in 1773. After several years of visiting different cities in search of a suitable position, he settled in Vienna, where he spent his fi the final decade of his life. At Vienna, he composed most of his greatest compositions. Moreover, his genius was recognised by both established composers such as Haydn and up-and-coming ones such as Beethoven. Despite his premature death at the age of 35, he left a huge body of work. His masterpieces include concerti, operas, chamber music, serenades and symphonies. They also include works of sacred music, such as the Coronation Mass, the C Minor Mass, the Motet Ave Verum Corpus, and the Requiem that he was composing at the time of his death. In this interview, Simon P. Keefe recommends some books that can help us learn about Mozart and appreciate his music more deeply. Simon P. Keefe is James Roster Hall Chair of Music at the University of Sheffield, a life member of the Academy for Mozart Research at the International Music Foundation in Salzburg, and President-elect of the Royal Musical Association. He is the author of five monographs on Mozart, including Mozart's Requiem, Reception, Work, Completion, published by Cambridge University Press in 2012. This book won the 2013 Marjorie Weston Emerson Award from the Mozart Society of America. Professor Keefe is the editor of a further seven volumes for Cambridge University Press, including Mozart Studies, Mozart Studies 2, and Mozart in Context. Professor Keith, welcome. Thank you. Um, what would you add, or briefly, what was missing from the opening summary of Mozart's life? Do you mean from your opening summary? Yes. Um, I mean, you, you've, I suppose you've given a, um, uh, a very quick kind of synopsis of, of um, of, of Mozart's life um, and uh, perfectly fine as it stands. Um, I mean, one could emphasize a lot more the travels that he um, that he did as a child. It's often um, estimated that around about a third of his life up to the point at which he moved to Vienna in 1781 was spent on the road, so to speak. Um, so either the Grand Tour of 1763 to 1766 or the time in uh, in in France and Germany, 1777 to 1779, um, the Italian trip, 1770 to 1772, so or early 1773. So a lot, enormous amount of time that he was spent uh, that he spent travelling, um, and I think that that's in many ways um, one of the core things that one needs to approve. One of the basic things one needs to appreciate, I think, about Mozart, as in how he becomes such a kind of cosmopolitan. Uh, musician, the fact that he, the fact that it was he was exactly the right individual um, uh, to have the experiences that he had, that his father Leopold organised for him in his youth, uh, in terms of giving him so much access to other musicians, other musicians, other styles, uh, and he was just he just had that capability of absorbing it. So he becomes such a kind of a cosmopolitan, such a um, uh, uh, a sort of uh, what's the right word? Well, cosmopolitan is yes, so good kind of sort of international kind of mind, mindset, um, uh, well ahead of <laughs> that becoming anything that that was remotely normal. Um, 
Um, so yeah, so I would tend to think that those travel experiences, which are particularly intense before he moves to Vienna in 1781, age 25 or so, um, I think that they're they're particularly um, I I important. And I, I suppose the other thing that's that I always I I kind of uh, re well, wrestle with is a little strong, but I always kind of ponder a little bit is whether it's whether Mozart's kind of youthful of quite remarkable prodigiousness um, in his youth is more or less remarkable than the than the extraordinary quality of his music uh, in the last 10 years of his life. And and it strikes me that there, and in fact, actually, there's no answer to that. I might marginally favor the, the late music because that's what, what I know uh, best and what I've always um, uh, found most attractive to study, although I've also worked on his earlier music as well. But um, um, I might slightly favor the, 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 the latter. But it is just quite remarkable how those two things go together. You know, this this incredible prodigy um, who had the experiences that he had um, and then, you know, seeing that right the way through to the 1780s to 1791 and his death and the kind of uh, um, uh, and, and the extraordinary quality of the music. Um, that he that he produced. So so you know I might tend to think that that's something that's also always worth kind of emphasizing in the Mozart uh, story. And often a question that comes up among Catholics is how could Mozart be such a committed Freemason? Indeed, some of his compositions, such as the Magic Flute, the Masonic Funeral Music, or the Secular Cantata di Sele des Veltals, celebrate Masonic ideas. However, Pope Clement XII had already condemned Freemasonry in 1738 for its reductive conception of Christianity. So how serious was Mozart about his Catholic faith? I think you're very serious about both his Catholic faith and his uh, Catholic faith and his um, uh, his his status as a Mason. Um, I think that the, the the kind of yes, it was always a controversial um uh com sometimes confrontational relationship between masonry and and catholicism um uh in 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 kind of late 18th century europe but i think that it's fair to say that that there was a kind of sense of 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 coexistence um not easy coexistence sometimes quite complicated coexistence in vienna in the habsburg um lands um in the late 18th century and that's partially i think because you know joseph ii was such a um, was such an enlightened uh, leader, such an enlightened um, uh, emperor. Um, I mean, he certainly had his faults. He had his difficulties. Um, uh, 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 he had, um, and 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 the end of his life is somewhat sad. Not only because he died young, but also because he had to row back from from so many of his kind of enlightened advances in the earlier part of the 1780s, on account largely of the, the French Revolution and and uh, and unhappiness about it, or an uncertainty and and fear among the nobility as to what would actually happen in uh, in Austria. But I think the fact that Joseph II was as he was a very himself a very devout Catholic, of course. Um, uh, and tolerant, uh, not only, well, tolerant, uh, full stop, really, and that toleration um, extended not only to Jews, to Protestants, um, uh, but also to, 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 to Masons uh, and Masonry as well. So I think that actually, whereas that is, I agree that that is a, that is a difficult relationship in all kinds of ways, um, it was an acceptable relationship um, in the late 18th century in Austria. But you brought up the figure of Joseph. I mean, he was let's say, not entirely orthodox, because, for example, he was trying to, he's known sometimes as the, sac the sacristan emperor, because he was he was rather overstepping the bounds and dictating all these liturgical norms. Uh, he was basically closed down all the monasteries, unless they, such as the Cistercians, unless they dedicate themselves to parish life. So is there a, there was a very rationalist strain that some that goes somewhat against the more supernatural and tradition-oriented aspect of Catholicism. Did Mozart have that same sort of tendency? Difficult to tell. Now, of course, you're absolutely right that Joseph II, um, uh, in terms of kind of orthodox Catholicism, as I would understand it at least, um, uh, is, is yes, is again a controversial and, and, and difficult figure. Um, whether Mozart's um, yes, Mozart's views, religious views, are difficult um, to determine, um, and his religious views actually are interesting in relation, particularly to those of his of his father. And it's almost a kind of a generational um, uh, conflict. Um, I think there's a. The, the, it's not that Mozart wasn't devout; he clearly was. Um, I think his it, fundamentally, I think his. This is perhaps me speaking more than 
um, uh, 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 more than I'm entitled to in some ways. But this is certainly my sense from lead, reading the letters, which we'll come on to, because it's one of my choices, obviously. Um, but I think there's there's less of a, um, a, a fundamental critical interest in religion, I think, than there is for his father, Leopold. Um, and you, you often get this kind of sense, this back and forth, Leopold um, uh, talks about, yeah, Leopold is, 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 is a wonderful figure in Mozart's biography and, and in some ways uh, mal wrongly, very, very wrongly maligned in, 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 in some circles because the amount that he put into sort of nurturing Mozart, educating and taking him around, the, uh, around Europe. Uh, was was truly extraordinary, um, and Leopold was an intense, a, a very intense and very intensely serious man. Uh, perhaps most especially in regard to religion, um, and he would. Uh, there was a, basically a kind of conflict, I think, between the two. On the one hand, Leopold would say, you know, yes, I accept that that it's God's will that something should happen, but you must do everything you possibly can to um, uh, to, to influence that situation. Vo uh, Wolfgang, as in as in Mozart's response, was always, well, if it's God's will, there's not much I can do about it. Um, and there is that kind of sense that, I mean, where, how one reads that and interprets that, I would interpret that as fundamentally um, uh, a, a um, uh, not a lack of interest in religion from from Mozart, but perhaps a kind of sense that when he makes his statements about, you know, the most important thing next to my father is God, and and that, he, that there is a kind of a bit of a sort of formulaic quality um, in in Mozart's language. He's saying what he wants his father uh, to hear, um, which is not to say that he's not devout, not um, not 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 a, a good Catholic in 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 various respects. Um, but as I say, I think there's a, that I think for Mozart, as in Mozart's son, not Mozart's father, for Mozart, um, I think, you know, music is his life, music's his world. Um, he, uh, you know, his father accuses him of not being very practical in the way that he thinks about life and moving through life. Um, and that's, there is some, there is some validity to that for sure, because Mozart was living in his, was living in this sort of kind of musical world, it come totally and utterly and completely immersed in it. And I think other things, it was how other things, which is not to say he wasn't influenced by things outside music, he certainly was, but, but music was so much the core of everything he did, everything he thought about, he was so immersed in it. And he he says that himself, you know, he said to his father, um, you know, you know, I'm completely immersed in music. I think about it all of the time. And he does. So everything else is a kind of a in, in, in effect, a kind of adjunct to that. Um, uh, and I think that that's, you know, there's a there's a kind of difference in that sort of in that kind of religious way of thinking about things, I think, from from Leopold to Mozart. So where Mozart sat. So to answer your question, Dominic, and um, um, and it is a good one, but it's difficult to. To, to answer where Mozart sat relative to a, a religious thinker like Joseph II, albeit a controversial um, one, um, is difficult to say. I mean, there's, there is one thing that um, Joseph II did and that Archbishop Colorado, the sort of the equivalent in Salzburg, um, did. I mean, sort of in effect, a kind of vassal state of the, of, of the Habsburg, Salzburg, obviously small, and, and um, but independent. And Colorado, who, who Mozart famously um, detested, Leopold detested him too. He'd been, Leopold had been passed over for promotion. Uh, he was seen to be, Colorado was seen to be haughty and dictatorial. And in reality, he had a, a tough budget to, to deal with because the previous archbishop had been um, uh, profligate in his spending. Um, so Colorado had, had, had had to rein things in. The Mozarts took that personally. Mozart desperate to get away, etc. It's a fascinating story. But what both Colorado in Salzburg and above all Joseph II did, did in 1780s was very much to rein back the, as, as you're in effect alluding to, the kind of lavishness of of Catholic services. So there was a there was a kind of a maximum amount that a mass uh, should take, ma maximum amount of time. Can't remember what it was. Either perhaps half an hour, three quarters of an hour, something like that. And in effect, that meant things like music had to take a back seat. So Mozart's, I mean, you may have picked up on this, but Mozart's um, composed very little sacred music in the last ten years of his life. Um, all of his sacred, oh, the, the vast majority, 90 percent or so of his sacred music comes from before his move to Vienna in 1781, and that's precisely really because um, it, it wasn't, it, it wasn't, in, you, you know, you weren't encouraged to write a lot of sacred music in 1780s uh, Vienna. Mozart still remained very interested in it. That's quite clear. There are fragments. There are. Um, uh, bits he was clearly working on that didn't then materialize into full works. But each of the 
sacred works in, in, in the Viennese, the, the final decade, has a kind of unusual genesis. Perhaps we'll get onto the, that in a, bit, uh, in a bit more detail later. But the C minor mass was basically written, uh, well, we don't know, there's a quite a, a bit of a mystery attached to, 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 um, uh, uh, to, to why it was written. Seems to probably relate to personal circumstances, Mozart's marriage, perhaps Constanza's recovery from an illness. But it was really kind of intended for, Par for, for Salzburg, rather, for the so-called bridal visit when Mozart took Constanza back to visit Leopold and, um, and uh, Mozart's daughter Nanel. Um, uh, uh, the Requiem is, is, is sort of kind of one of a kind and unfinished anyway, right at the end of his life. And then the Ave Verum Corpus is a very short work for Corpus Christi, uh, either in Baden or, or, or in Vienna, most likely in Baden. So, the, the, you know, these kind of the, the what have become sort of, uh, we perceive to be kind of central works of Mozart in the last decade of his life. They are wonderful works, all very different in their very different ways, but but are actually in a way not really central to 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 the to Mozart's main business in the last uh, uh, in the last ten years of his life. So um, so yeah, sorry, that's a long way of answering a short question, but I hope it, I hope it gives you some useful information. Anyway. Yes, and so perhaps approaching the same question from a somewhat different angle, we listen to Mozart because his music is spiritually enriching in the broad sense of the term. Um, the Christian spirituality of the sacred music of Bach and Bruckner often seems to suffuse their instrumental compositions. At least that's how I hear it. But Mozart's non-sacred music, written at the height of the Enlightenment, strikes me as having a more humanistic than religious orientation. The ethos of his music is closer to, say, that of Shakespeare or Moliere than that of Dante. Perhaps this question sounds silly and pompous, but does Mozart's music convey a certain spirituality or ethos, and to what extent is it Christian? That's a that's a fascinating question. Um, I'm not sure I'm equipped um, to 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 answer it. Um, I'm not religious myself. I'm I'm I'm, I'm an atheist, um, although I have a great time and um, respect and interest um, in 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 religion. Um, I think actually, so so it's actually it's actually a difficult question. It's a very I think it's a very personal uh, question. Um, as as you're saying, you know, by 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 saying what you sense in terms of Mozart's. Um, uh, values that that appear to come um, from it. Um, I would say that there is. I, mean, I, I would agree that there is a kind of strongly kind of humanistic element to, to Mozart's um, uh, kind of instrumental music. Um, I do hear things. I, I absolutely hear it that way as well. In fact, my first book um, was on Mozart's, or basically an outgrowth of my my PhD dissertation was on Mozart's piano concertos and how, in effect, there are there are enlightened themes that come through that relative to collaboration, um, cooperation, and the way that that's mapped out over the course of a, um, um, uh, over a concerto, both in individual movements and, a, and, a, and the whole span of a work. Um, and I do think of that, I do think that is fundamentally a, a kind of a humanistic um, phenomenon. Um, uh, yes, as I say, I wouldn't necessarily be the right person to talk about yeah. relative to, to, to Bach, for example, although I, I absolutely what you're saying is is entirely um, uh, what what religious friends of mine would also say about about Bach's music. And I find it Bach's music is 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 absolutely extraordinary, remarkable um, too. how one hears that and interprets that is a, is, a, is a different um, a different question. But yes, yeah, certainly in regard to Mozart, I would hear that humus, humanistic quality coming through in the instrumental music. But, I mean, even in. The operas, for example, especially the, the ones he, um, in which he collaborated with the Italian priest and librettist Lorenzo da Ponte, yeah, there are implicit religious, sometimes explicit, as in Don Giovanni, who faces divine retribution at the end, but perhaps implicit ones in other operas, for example, um, in Così fan tutte as an explanation, exploration of human frailty, and then in Peter Schaeffer's play Amadeus, Salieri attends the premiere of Le Nozze di Figaro and is amazed at how an opera buffa con concludes with such a sublime chorus and forgiveness. I'm not sure, yes. do you have any? Yes, I mean, I, I, again, whether one, I, I suppose I wouldn't disagree with any of that, um, uh, whether one sees those as, 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 as religious or humanistic um, uh, concepts, uh, themes, of course, is a, is a different um, matter. I certainly wouldn't read those as, as exclusively um, uh, religious, although I can completely understand that they have uh, they have religious resonance in in every sense. Um, uh, yes, I mean I think relative to opera, one needs to be one needs to tread fairly carefully, of course, because 
where an opera comes from, uh, how the opera is designed, it's a very much a collaborative um, uh, process, a collaborative um, uh, activity. Um, and that collaboration, of course, uh, at the principal level is, is connects to the librettist and the composer, but there are so many others involved as well, singers and writing for individual singers, how an adaptation works of a, well, whether it's an adaptation uh, in, in Figaro's case of the Beaumarchais, um, play very controversial from a few years um, earlier and on Giovanni's case it's the Don Juan legend that goes back uh, at least 150 years Moliere etc um, uh, um, and and basically Da Ponte expands that enormously he's brilliant um, uh, librettist there's no question about that at all with Figaro it's much more about contracting because the play is is um, is uh, is is long and very involved. A uh, lot more ca uh, characters involved in in Figaro who, uh, in the play that that don't make it into the opera. So it was a more a, a job of, of of making it concise. And Cosi Fantotti famously is just a kind of a, a combination of all kinds of sort of um, uh, recent, as in 18th century, and earlier kind of uh, mythological, almost mythological uh, sources from the Renaissance, etc. So it's a kind of this this combination of um, um, of, of of, 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 of numerous different sources. So I think in regard to how one sees um, uh, uh, operas, I think perfectly entitled to see there being a kind of um, uh, a religious dimension there. Although, as I say, I, would, I might argue that, um, that that could be represented in enlightened humanistic uh, yeah. one as well. Uh, what are trying to do as a musicologist to Mozart rather than any of the other great composers? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I mean, first of all, I, as an oboist, I was attracted to, to playing Mozart, a couple of uh, um, well-known oboe works, uh, oboe quartet and the oboe concerto, um, both from his relatively early years. Um, so initial attraction to, to Mozart that way. And I think I think with Mozart, it's always, or for me, it is always kind of just the sheer kind of diversity of what you've got um, there, more than any other composer in the late 18th century, as much as I admire so many other composers, particularly Haydn, of course, um, from the late 18th century. The, the thing about Mozart is he, he's, he's represented everywhere. So he's, you know, he's a fantastic dramatist, but he's also a fantastic pianist, a fantastic composer of piano concertos, symphonies, string quartets. So you've got, you've got kind of all bases covered. So when you move, um, when you move with Mozart and listen to him in different kind of areas, you know, you can hear bits of <laughs> uh, all these kind of ways of thinking about music. Um, uh, and different styles and different genres um, um, as you go through, as you travel through his uh, his repertory. Um, and, and since the quality is so high, um, you know, it's a, it's an enriching experience in, in in every way. And I don't think there's anybody, in spite of the fact Mozart died um, at only 35, um, uh, which makes it obviously his, his achievements <laughs> all the more remarkable. But I don't think there's anybody quite like him in terms of in covering so many bases, so to speak, um, musically. And that's, I've always found that attractive, um, as well as the great kind of uh, sort of, the, it's, you mentioned Shakespeare earlier, and it's a, this kind of Shakespearean sense that he can move on a turn on a dime, as it were, and 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 suddenly you you can go from poignancy, you can go from power to poignancy, to to great emotion to uh, to reflection, um, and he seems to be able to do that. Those kind of those pivots, so 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 sort of so sort of amazingly that. Um, uh, that um, that you know again that's a very that's always been something that's extremely attractive to me as well. Bach resorts extensively to counterpoint in his composition, whereas Haydn, Beethoven, and Brahms often develop movements or whole compositions out of a motif. Mozart's compositional technique is perhaps harder to pin down. What are the distinctive characteristics of his music? How does his style of composition differ from that of his contemporaries? Um, I think that the perhaps the difference. I, um, I, I would think actually, you know, there's, there's there's sometimes kind of discussion of how you know the 18th century represents a move from kind of you know these sort of contrapuntal geniuses, so to speak, like um, like like uh, Bach and, and and Handel particularly, um, to kind of a, a less kind of complex style. I, I mean, I'd be wary about that thinking about things um, uh, that way, because both Haydn and, and Mozart were, Mozart particularly perhaps, were were extremely skilled as writers of, of, of fugues as well. So, you know, the, the kind of the highest form of, uh, 
uh, of, of, of counterpoint. But I think it reflects uh, uh, when you're asking that question specifically about Mozart and how he's different. Um, I'm, I think it goes back to something I was saying earlier about this kind of sense of cosmopolitanness. So um, actually, it's it's difficult in many ways to talk about him as a Viennese composer or as a Salzburg-based composer, even sometimes as an Austrian composer, in as far as Austria um, uh, existed um, at that time. At that time, as anything more than a kind of conceptual kind of identity, is a conceptual identity of what Austria was. Um, but um, but so it's this kind of sense that because he absorbs so many different styles, so many different ways of thinking about music, um, you know that that kind of comes out in in all sorts of ways in 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 his music. Um, and I mean, some people some people kind of pass that kind of qualitatively which it's which it's fine that's fine to do that um uh you know you won't find many of us who who will argue um that mozart isn't um uh, qualitatively um above pretty much everybody else in the in in the late 18th century possible exception of haydn um but so so, so but one that doesn't necessarily need to think about it qualitatively as, as i say it can be about how the style kind of transmits itself how it kind of conveys its qualities to us um, in the course of listening to to a work, and and I think that it's that kind of sense of uh, of of there being so many aspects to it, such you know, as I say, ability to be both kind of suave and then slightly crude or crass and and poignant and 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 powerful, um, all within the space of you know minutes, as it were. That the, 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 the it's this kind of he's got this sort of complete control of his material um, and of what it um, expresses and what it is seen to represent. And when I say that, I, mean, I think that applies equally in instrumental music as it does in um, in vocal music and uh, uh, including opera. And four of the five books you've recommended are biographical. Is it essential to know about Mozart's life and context to appreciate his music or merely helpful? That's, again, a very good um, question. Um, I would say um, I would say actually that it is essential um, that I, well, I would find um, I would think it essential to not to have some biographical understanding, biographical broadly uh, conceived. Um, and you're quite right. The the the, the choices of uh, of my books are uh, predominantly biographical, um, although they're all biographies to some extent. Um, uh, if we count the letters as biography, um, uh, or biography with a difference, as it were. Um, and um, uh, so so I think that that kind of that th that because, as I was saying earlier, he's so immersed in music because music is everywhere for him. It's, you know, music's in his head the whole time, you know, the classic kind of, um, uh, I mean, which is no doubt a simplification, but classic kind of uh, uh, um, uh, kind of way of thinking about Mozart is what he said himself, which is that the, 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 work, is all, the work is in his head and it isn't actually just written down. So the composing goes on in his head and the writing down is, um, uh, is something that happens subsequently. That is a, a, a simplification, both on Mozart's part, clearly, and also on the part of many uh, biographers, but it it is definitely it's definitely the case because he's living constantly with 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 music, totally absorbed in it. Um, uh, you know that that I think one needs to understand kind of what he's going through, how he's how he's progressing, as it were, through life, um, uh, in order to kind of get a sense uh, uh, of what his music um, uh, may or may not mean um uh, relative to, to to how it's significant or or not in certain instances so so i think i think i think as i say i might be i might be inclined to say what biography is is uh is is, is the heart of the question um there um and i could see biography um as uh, as much more than simply telling a tale of of kind of life and and uh, and works um and that it needs actually inherently needs to be considerably more nuanced and sophisticated um, than that, and I think that comes through in, the, in, in, in hopefully in the choices that I've made in, in terms of books. Um, but I would say that some sort of kind of way of understanding Mozart through his biography is indeed uh, uh, extremely helpful. Yeah. Your first selected book is Emily Anderson's edition of Letters of Mozart and His Family. What makes this collection a good read, and how does it help us appreciate Mozart's music? <laughs> 
I mean, this is Mozart um, uh, from the horse's mouth, so to speak. I mean, because we've got Mozart um, uh, talking about, I mean, you know, we've got a volume, I've got it right here, big fat volume, 30,000 pages or so, in its, in its English translation at least, um, the German edition is, um, is even longer. Um, Oops, sorry, I put it back on my shelf. It's a passion book, passion book, as the Germans like to say. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, it's quite a, yes, quite a, uh, quite a doorstop there. Um, yeah, so it's, um, uh, but it, you know, it, it's, it's Mozart, it's Mozart speaking to us directly, as it were. Um, and, you know, that has so much, that's so relevant to everything connected to, I think, his life um, and his music. Um, you know, we've got his views, we've got his views on, on aesthetics, we've got his views on instrumental music, we've got practicalities um, uh, uh, of life, we've got issues relating to travel, we've got references to other musicians all of the time, um, emotions, um, his relationships with uh, problematic, wonderful, um uh, uh powerful sad etc in in every um in every respect coming through over the course of those um those thousand pages or so so he speaks directly to us and this is what um i mean i so my la last project was a i may have mentioned to you um in, in an email but was is a big kind of study of haydn and mozart reception in the 19th century um and so i was looking at a lot of kind of early biographies and and there's one particularly problematic um one because it's uh um, well, it's, it was done by um, uh, Constanza Mozart's um, second husband, um, Georg von Nissen, um, uh, and it's basically a patchwork quilt of kind of pulling together of various pre previously published sources. We might talk about it now being kind of plagiarized, although I don't think plagiarism existed in the same way in the early 19th century as it does now. But its major contribution was to publish it got it got enormous tranches of letters, predominantly from Mozart's wife, Constanza, because Nissen was married to her, but also from Nanel, um, from Mozart's sister. And it published the letters for the first time. And you get you see in reviews of Nissen in the late uh, um, late 1820s, people just can't you know just can't believe that this is Mozart suddenly speaking to them. Um, and whereas that kind of immediacy of of kind of you know that must have been extraordinary 30 years after Mozart's death. You know, we don't have that experience now because the the words and the phraseology and the and the ideas are, are, are all ideas that um uh, that have been discussed and dissected and combed over in it with a fine tooth comb so to speak um uh so so we don't get that kind of sense of them being novel and of that kind of great release of kind of all of these ideas but nonetheless um because we because we're so familiar with them um now 200 years on but there's still this kind of sense of when you dip into the letters um, um you're hearing mozart think through various issues various problems um uh, uh you know his personality is 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 coming alive uh, for us and that's even if the translation in the case of anderson's translation which is um uh, uh somewhat too elegant really to too victorian in a way it makes him sound a little bit like he's from the kind of late 19th century rather than the late 18th um and he wrote in a kind of uh, a dialect in effect salzburgian kind of dialect with his father um, and not particularly elegantly, but the letters are uh, are, are translated in a way that, that that makes them read elegantly, which one can say is a little bit problematic. But that that doesn't bother me especially um, because it's above all the ideas and the and the personality that are coming alive uh, through reading them. It's just um, it's it's fantastic either to read it in in um, in in whole um, uh, from cover to cover or just to dip into. And uh, and at its very best, the correspondence between Mozart and his father is just um, is just wonderful. For example, the Opera Domineo, which um, um, uh, which was premiered at the end of January uh, uh, 1781 in Munich, was when Mozart was still based in Salzburg. Um, so Mozart went to Munich. So the pot it had been commissioned. He knew it was going to happen. But for the last few months, he went to Munich both to be at well, bubble to be able to deal with the singers and 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 discuss the music that they wanted. Um, and there ended up being this this the, the librettist um, uh, Varesco was based in Salzburg. So Leopold um, became the kind of go between for the ideas that Mozart was sending back to Varesco and that Varesco was sending uh, uh, via Le uh, Leopold back to Mozart. So that you could see you can see the drama and the music kind of taking shape uh, uh, for both of them, both of them being Mozart and Leopold, because Leopold's having his say as well in, in terms of what he thinks um, should happen in, in, in the Domino, both how it should function dramatically um, and also um, uh, what the music should do. And you get this wonderful correspondence for 
for two or three months, uh, end of 1780, beginning of 1781, where it's all about musical ideas and, uh, and about how um, uh, how instruments should function and there are practical issues as well in terms of what's available for Mozart and what isn't. Um, um, and Idomeneo was a great success, but that in a way is by the by, um, um, that's less important than the fact that, you know, as you see the the, the, the genesis of the opera kind of opening up in front of you. Um, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful spectacle um, and a wonderful um, read. And as I say, it's testimony to, to at, at their very best, and their re relationship in some ways was quite problematic, certainly at, at, at key moments, uh, Leopold and Mozart. But at their very best, um, you know, they they were in, they were just just kind of fantastic musicians um, and great thinkers in regards to 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 the way a musical piece can be constructed uh, broadly conceived. Thank you for listening. To read or listen to the rest of this interview and gain full access to our archive, visit fivebooksforcatholics.com and become a premium subscriber. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast and give it a top rating on the platform of your choice. That way more people can discover it. You can also support the podcast and help us produce more interviews like this one by making a one-off donation via the link given in the show notes. As little as one dollar, one pound or one euro can help and will be greatly appreciated. Thank you once again and God bless. <laughs>